thank you for the kind introductions. It's great honor um, to speak in this wonderful event in the workshop and seminar of the Philippines. Uh, well, I'm Sang Ho Ro. Let me introduce myself again briefly. I'm a historian who study intellectual history of Korea, uh, which covers uh, the 18th century to the early 20th century. So, well, I, I know that these uh, uh, topics of Korean philosophy and thoughts may not be so much popular topic to people, but uh, let me try to explain it. Uh, well, for a general audience and for the educators in the Philippines. Um, so, well, basically today I will talk about Korean philosophy in the so-called late Joseon period. Uh, you probably know that Korea had the last dynasty up to 1910 before the Japanese colonial rule. And in this so-called late Joseon period, there uh, were pretty uh, dynamic interactions uh, in domestically and, in, and internationally. So today I will try to approach and explain what happened in the 18th and 19th century in Joseon, Korea from the history of philosophy. So let me begin my lecture by sharing my PPT. And title is Korean Rationalism and Empiricism Seen from the History of Philosophy. Um, well, Korean intellectual experience have a long and complex history. Uh, considering its locations next to China, we can easily understand that Korean philosophy had received enormous influence from its continental neighbor, China. Uh, so when you probably teach Korean philosophy and religion, you as a teacher uh, will refer to Chinese uh, philosophy and religion a lot. So I think that's correct to begin with Chinese philosophy and try to understand how Koreans localize this foreign religion and philosophy in their own soil. So today I will uh, explain one example uh, in which Koreans well reinvented this continental philosophy uh, in their own ways. Uh, so, well, if we say that Koreans received huge influence from China and Chinese philosophy, I think this statement is correct in one way, uh, but as an educator, we also must understand that it can be misleading if you just take it as a whole uh, picture about Korea. Uh, because Korean thinkers for many centuries before modern time and even after uh, modern times try to uh, reinvent these foreign ideas uh, as a Korean philosophy. So, Korean Buddhism, Korean Confucianism, a probably most well-known example of Korean philosophy uh, will uh, seem from this long traditions of interaction between Korea and, and China. Uh, so Koreans had developed and refined a way to import foreign ideas and to adapt them for their own need. So more often than not, new ideas entered Korea and soon they changed it into something else of their own inventions. So, well, even today, Koreans always add K plus something, K culture, K science, K hygiene. So I think it's, it is one example of such, you know, localizing uh, the world of philosophy and ideas in, in their own country. 
Uh, to take another few examples, there are uh, Korean communism, In North Korea, DPRK, or Korean capitalism, in ROK, South Korea. Uh, so I think Korea is, in that sense, is quite uh, peculiar and interesting. Uh, in in their uh, so long techniques of localizations. In, in philosophy and culture. So it is important to comprehend the deeply rooted tension between the universal and the local in the Korean history of thought. So basically today I will show you this one picture that uh, Koreans move back and forth between the universal idea and their local experience. Or you can, uh, well, add an emotion or feeling. Well, although well, Western world explain Confucianism or, or, or communism or capitalism in their own traditions, Koreans are, are sometimes feel the need that uh, they have to understand it uh, from their own perspective. So this local experience and emotions always played a critical role in the developments of a Korean's uh, worldview. In today's lecture, so I will introduce you to this everlasting tension between two bipoles, uh, universal idea and local emotions. Uh, to, put in, to put in a, another way, I, I reinterpreted it as the tension between rationalism and empiricism. Well, uh, I, I know my, many people are not a good, uh, great fan of philosophy, but uh, well, uh, just well understand uh, my lecture as an introduction to Koreans' uh, worldview uh, on the eve of modern uh, age. Uh, well, rationalism and empiricism are not commonly used in East Asian philosophy. I admit that uh, because these two terms, rationalism and empiricism, have their origins in Western philosophy. Some may feel awkward uh, and may ask questions uh, of why we need to use these two Western philosophical terms to explain East Asian uh, philosophy. Uh, well, however, despite the obvious foreignness of these two terms, I dare to use them as an academic tool for better understanding the trajectory of Korean thought. So uh, I think it is uh, a proper, most of all, to define rationalism precisely uh, enough to deepen our discussions and, and move to the next stage. Well, uh, so far, uh, Korean scholars explain this time of Korean history with the term of a shithak. So I think history teachers in, in this seminar are probably familiar with this term shithak, a practical learning. Uh, Koreans will explore it, well, real world with a scientific and more practical method. But uh, I do not agree with this uh, uh, term shilhak, a practical learning as the term to explain this intellectual change in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, well, and those who use the term shilhak in Korean history and philosophy often emphasize that there was a great master of Shilhak, and that was Chong Ya Gyeong. But my question uh, for this lecture and also my research uh, in, in my first book and the upcoming book is that uh, do we need to really use this practical learning as a, a well, valid academic term to analyze 
uh, Korean's world view back then. Uh, first fact is that uh, scholars in the 18th and 19th century did not use the term shilhak to define themselves. They did never call themselves shilhak scholars. Uh, this term rather appeared in, in the early 20th century and historians use this term in hindsight. Uh, they want to differentiate 18th and 19th century philosophy from the previous neo-confucianism. So they uh, came up with this, this new term practical learning. So uh, I, that's one of the things I want to share with you in the beginning. And also my question is, if we want to use this term practical learning, the so-called practicality did really matter in their research. Uh, my question is, to put it another way, practicality uh, can uh, define the new thoughts of the uh, late Chosun period. So um, I want to put a question mark here. And I also uh, will ask you to, uh, well, forget this term, Shira, when you listen to my lecture. Uh, in a general term, rationalism can be defined as a belief or a theory that reason is the foundation of certainty in knowledge. And reason means the power of human intelligence. to think, understand, and to make decisions by a process of logic. Here, logic is a process of a pure reasoning, which is independent from uh, individual experiences. So we have an ability to make a judgment without depending on individual experience, or to put in a, a more philosophical term, sense experience. Well, nowadays, many people, you know, uh, earn knowledge from YouTube after they watch a news clip or short uh, videos. So that's basically the way of empiricism. It's not rationalism. If we uh, follow rationalism, we must develop our innate power of reasoning. For example, mathematics. Uh, if someone do the mathematical thinking, that means they do not depend on one or two experiences. They use premise, one principle, mathematical principle, which is universal beyond any time or place. So uh, mathematicians in Europe and mathematicians in South Af America, they all use the same method. So rationalism is basically a universal tool. And there is a no difference between Koreans and Filipinos, Koreans, Chinese. Rationalism therefore define a human as a one same quality of the pure reason. Uh, so uh, let me continue to talk about uh, rationalism a little bit more before we jump into the Korean story. Uh, the power of a mind in uh, this school of philosophy uh, can function alone without depending on any experience. So pure reasoning is a, a priori in Latin. This is also a little bit of a uh, uh, well, philosophical jargon. But well, as a general uh, knowledge, we can just understand it as a knowledge earned without experience. So we can uh, know something without having an experience. We know that, well, the gun is dangerous without experiencing the gun itself, right? So uh, that's one way of a priori. Uh, so it means the pure reasoning not only proceed experiences, but also exist independently and superiorly above all variables in human sense informations. 
So some people can see on uh, one scene is beautiful and the other people can have uh, different opinions, but in, in rationalism, we have to have some universal standard to make a judgments about beauty. So there is no doubt that rationalism flowered most in continental Europe, France and Germany, and it reached the highest level of philosophical discussions in Western Europe. At the same time, however, we can find some, some thought in Asia, which also elaborated on the power of human mind before sense experience kicks in. In East Asian language, Koreans, Japanese, and Chinese all use the same character to translate rationalism uh, in their language. And um, it is a character of Li. Uh, for Korean language teachers, you probably heard this term, ichi or tori. And also I, I put here isong, rationality or reason. Well, East Asian people translate this uh, Western concept in this word isong and hamni, which has this all same character li in common. So no li means logic. So you, uh, we can uh, agree that uh, uh, well, East Asian philosophy has its own traditions and concept of rationality, even before they understood East Western European philosophy uh, in the modern times. And I think the, the, what we have to pay attention is the concept of Li. Uh, so East Asian people used to uh, explain the meaning of human reason by this traditional philosophical concept of Li. If we translate Li in English, there are two possible translations. One is a principle or universal principle. And the other is a pattern. Well, again, a universal pattern. Well, before the modern age, East Asian thinkers will, will believe that there is a one universal principle. So if we plant a seed, then it will grow into a flower. That is a leaf. So it will follow a certain pattern or principle. So uh, I think the English translation principle and, and patterns are not exactly uh, correct to, um, to explain the concept of Li, but roughly or for conventional uh, reason, we can uh, translate into these two different words, principle or pattern. So now uh, we understand that uh, East Asian philosophy already had this uh, pre-existing concept of universal principle. Uh, so Li should be used uh, in the place of the reason when uh, East Asian peoples first on, uh, learn about a uh, Western concept of ration, rationality and, and reason. So Li is uh, uh, a law itself. And uh, although we, we cannot find exact equivalent concept of the Li in English, uh, we generally understand that that was uh, roughly the meaning of the principle or pattern. Uh, apparently, neo-Confucianisms uh, distrusted human experience any, and any conclusion derived only from sense experience. Uh, well, one of the leading philosophers of the neo-Confucianism, or we can add the Chinese, Chinese neo-Confucianism, was a Jew C, a medieval uh, a philosopher of China. And Jew C uh, summarized uh, uh, and, well, completed uh, Neo Confucianism as a school of philosophy. And he summarized his method to a key word, the investigation of things and the extension of knowledge. According to Jew C's uh, teachings, and methodology, one can reach a true knowledge uh, from 
analogy. So uh, people can compare one things with another. So if we see filial piety from, uh, well, that is, for example, uh, from a dog, then we can extend it, it to humans. And then we can uh, make an analytical thinking that this is a universal principle. So this analogy of neo-confucianism uh, well, can be understood from the term investigation of things. So neo-confucianists, according to Zhu Xi, a Chinese philosopher, must learn about things other than human nature. So they have to observe uh, trees and animals, and they also have an experience, but this experience was the basic step for having a superior knowledge. So that's the extension of knowledge. Well, to put it a more uh, precise way, it's moral knowledge. We have to uh, have ethical knowledge that someone uh, or anyone should be a failure to parents. Uh, that is uh, correct and it is a universal law. Uh, so Koreans uh, learned this Chinese philosophy uh, from China uh, from the 14th century. And uh, as we all know that uh, Korea had two master of this philosophy. The first one is Yi Huang. Uh, well, you can see his uh, portrait in oh, Chonon, uh, 1000 Bill, and we have also Yi, uh, another great master of, of Neo-Confucianism in the 5000 uh, Bill. Uh, so on the surface, it may sound like a studying all phenomena of the things uh, is quite similar to the scientific way of learning. But, uh, well, if you look more carefully, uh, Neo-Confucianism was quite different from science. Uh, I know some philosophers in Singapore or in Hong Kong argue that, well, Neo-Confucianism was uh, uh, well, very similar to scientific thinkings. Of course, I agree with that, but it is not completely the same. We must able to differentiate these two different set of learnings and, and epistemology. So neo-confucianism only allowed investigation of things as the first step. So this is the first step, but ultimately we have to acquire moral knowledge. So ethics was the king of science uh, in neo-confucian uh, concept. So Juicy's uh, basic uh, thesis uh, founded Neo-Confucian epistemology, but also uh, caused many questions in the school as well. If we uh, think about his method, the investigation of things and extension of knowledge, we can have a natural questions. Uh, how can we learn about human uh, ethics from the, the knowledge of plants? or fish. Of course, uh, and animals, for example, dogs uh, can be very immoral or the beast, uh, they hunt down the weak animals. So, uh, well, neo-confusionists just uh, ignore this natural phenomenon and say that, well, that's not, uh, that's a violation of universal law. So you should not consider it an important source of knowledge. So basically, uh, neo-confucianism filtered many natural phenomena by the standard of ethics. So this is the pure knowledge. And these are all unnecessary and useless. But in, in modern science and in Western uh, science, this part actually more important. Well, as we will learn later, it is the realm of physics. 
Uh, so what did Juicy mean by the method of investigation of things and things in Confucianism and Chinese classics uh, means a much wider range of matters and lives. So uh, we should not get confused with uh, uh, this concept with Western uh, concept of things, uh, for example, like uh, Aristotle's physics. So Juicy did not provide clear guidance to the scientific or epistemological method in his theory of knowledge. Uh, in the history of Korean thought, Juicy's doctrine became uh, orthodox in the time of Joseon dynasty. Uh, and many famous Korean philosophers like Yi Hwang and Yi all devoted uh, their entire life uh, for better understanding of the Neo-Confucianism. So the so-called Lichi debate in the 15th century will represent uh, the local adoptions and local uh, discussions about Chinese philosophy and its concept of the Li in a traditional Korea. So Korean Confucianism came into being and it once and for all uh, transformed the way in which Koreans think and recognize themselves and, and uh, the, uh, the materials around them. Uh, my academic uh, research, uh, however, focused on a time after the formation of Korean Confucianism. And I think uh, one of the most important uh, thing we have to consider in the 18th and 19th century was the European philosophy. So Koreans began to have Western influence, and I uh, called it the first Westernization wave of Korea. And uh, because of the westernization, the only westernization of Korean uh, philosophy, uh, we saw um, the globalization or global connectivity of Korea surprisingly only in the 18th and 19th century. And uh, well, as a, uh, as a consequence of this first contact between Korea and the West, it gave rise to Confucian rationalism. So I'm not saying that Neo-Confucianism itself just remain the same all throughout the Korean uh, Joseon dynasty, but it has a time of renovation. And that renovation came from the impact of the European philosophy. Uh, well, it is a kind of a coincidence that I have a chance to give this lecture at uh, um, this Philippines uh, Ateneo University, which is a Jesuit school. So uh, let me tell you about the uh, the role, historical role of the Society of Jesus in this first westernization of Korea. Uh, Confucianism uh, entered another level of philosophical discussion in the 17th century. And surprisingly, such upgrading happened in the midst of the first encounter between the East and the West. European Jesuits uh, was the very first agents who introduced European culture, philosophy and religion to China first, and then Korea and later uh, other uh, part of East Asia. I'm sorry, I don't uh, know much about the Philippines, uh, but I believe the Jesuit also uh, entered the Philippines and started teaching uh, local students. So I think there must be some influence from the Jesuit and Jesuit uh, curriculum. One of the most renowned Jesuit was Italian priest Matteo Ricci, and he wrote several books on Confucian classics and European science. Uh, when Matteo Ricci explained the Catholic worldview in his book, Tian Zhu Shi, The True Meaning of the Lord of Heaven, he faithfully followed the orthodox teaching of the Jesuit school curriculum and tried to prove the existence of God by using Greek philosophy, especially the Catholic version of uh, 
of Aristotle. Uh, this Catholic version of Aristotle is called as Aristotelian Thomism in, in philosophy. And this was related to French rationalism later. Like in Aristotle Thomism, human minds has the power of pure reasoning and reason is a proof of God. And due to reason, humans are uh, superior to other, cult, other creatures and matters. And also, uh, well, the reason is a proof of God's existence. That's basically what Matthew Rich wanted to show and teach to the Chinese and other Asians uh, in his book. Uh, also, uh, when Matthew Rich wrote his book, uh, he borrowed the concept of Li. from New Confucianism, and he translated Aristotle Thomisms in classical Chinese by using this Neo Confucian concept. So you can, we can see that this mixture of Eastern and Western philosophy in a Jesuit's uh, books of the 17th and 18th century or uh, a little bit later. Uh, in his effort, efforts to uh, proselytize uh, Catholicism in Asia, Matteo Rich also noticed that European mathematics and science would benefit the mission work. Uh, it, Chinese scholars in, in the beginning uh, got impressed by European science and mathematics. So Matteo Rich, who also uh, had quite solid scientific education and Jesuit school, uh, was able to introduce European new science to East Asian uh, scholars. In the Chinese academic uh, tradition, mathematics also enjoyed a very high prestige as an ancient art of the great minds. So the ability of making accurate computations not only proved the high quality of one's mind, but also a proof of a priori. So uh, Confucian concept of morality. So people can make a moral judgments uh, without having an experience. So that is the natural power of humans minds in, in Neo-Confucianism. So we can see this quite uh, interesting, uh, uh, well, integration of the European uh, Catholicism and Neo-Confucian philosophy in the case of the Jesuit uh, Matteo Ricci's book. Uh, that is human intelligence and the morality is independent from experience shown by uh, mathematical thinking. So arithmetic uh, calculations uh, was the proof and science of better uh, idea, better thinking, higher thinking in humans. The high class function of human mind does not need any trial and error, but it needs a training over and over again, like mathematical learnings to see what our eyes cannot see. Uh, when Matteo Rich noted that Chinese literati showed great interest and curiosity on math, he chose to translate Euclid elements. So first uh, he used Aristotle's physics, and then he also used Euclid geometry. Although he did not translate the entire volumes of elements, uh, Rich and his co Chinese colleague Shu Huangqi uh, introduced this European math, European geometry for the first time in East Asia. If Rich wanted to attract Chinese literati by Aristotelian Thomisms and U Euclidean geometry, it turned out to be a great success. So Rich's fame and works were all spread out in East Asia. It also reached to Korea uh, in the 17th century. The so-called Sinocentrism well in Chinese Chunghua 
QE. So it means that, uh, well, non-Chinese respected Chinese culture as the only genuine human civilization. So they respected China and Chinese culture, and they also uh, believe that genuine knowledge only came from China. So it's called Sinocentrism. As I said in the beginning, Korean traditional intellectuals certainly had a tendency of Sinocentrism. They always looked up China and ancient China as the beginning of human civilizations. However, we also can see a quite ironic effect of Sinocentrism in the 17th century Korea, because Korean literati also quite keen to update themselves with the new Chinese uh, intellectual trend, and that include Jesuits. So when Koreans look carefully Chinese intellectual trend, they discovered the Jesuit book and they imported it quite enthusiastically. So Korean elite society respected China, uh, but now they also uh, uh, had the great uh, motivations to uh, learn the Jesuit and European philosophy through, uh, through China as their uh, window of, uh, of learning high uh, culture. So if Jesuit were part of new Chinese intellectual trends, Korean elite uh, probably uh, had no problem or difficulty in uh, keeping up themselves with the new trend. Uh, through the Koreans who visited Beijing as a member of diplomatic missions, the Jesuit books uh, by Matteo Rich and other Jesuit priests began to enter the Korean peninsula in the uh, 17th century and also circulate quite widely in the 18th century. And their curiosity uh, to the Western civilization developed among some intellectual circles. And one of the most leading figure in this new Western school of Korea, Western a school of Korean school of Western learning, uh, was a scholar named Yi. Uh, his pen name was uh, Song Ho. So I think uh, history students uh, uh, and uh, international students uh, probably have uh, some uh, information about uh, this philosopher uh, with the name of uh, Song Ho Yi. Uh, but it has nothing to do with my name, Song Ho, but uh, well, it just uh, the, the same sound, similar sounds, the Song Ho. Uh, so the Song Ho Yi, uh, Yi uh, well, quite passionately welcomed the Western uh, philosophy through the Jesuit. And uh, uh, well, there's uh, some the debate about his attitude toward Catholicism. Uh, well, but in general, we believe that Song Ho Yi uh, was quite indifferent to religions and faith, but he just wanted to know about the part of rationality. So uh, he basically picked up the Aristotle philosophy and uh, excluded this Catholic uh, uh, theology from uh, the teachings. Well, it was not that successful because many of his students became Catholics. So the uh, first Korean Catholic community appeared in Yik's students. So uh, we can see that, well, there was a certainly some connections uh, he from uh, his teaching to the Korean, uh, well, Christianity in the 18th century. But anyway, uh, when uh, he well, uh, passionately welcomed the Aristotelian Thomism and Euclidean geometry, uh, Korean Confucianism met a moment of renovations. Uh, he well, warmly received the teaching of the Jesuits and attempt to reinforce his Confucian belief with the concept of reason among many, well, he especially loved the concept of Logos. Uh, well, Logos is one of the three human powers in Aristotle philosophy, Logos, Pathos, and Ethos, but among three, well, actually, the Jesuit also emphasized Logos as a power uh, of humans and, and the gift by God. So uh, as a Confucian philosopher, he 
uh, will try to connect it to the, the Confucian concept of moral judgments. So how can we make a better moral judgments? Well, then he adopted Aristotle and said that we must have good scientific knowledge or rational knowledge. So good rationality means good morality in EX Confucian thinking. So it's quite an uh, interesting understanding about Aristotle in a Korean side. Uh, so, well, we can see that this logos uh, became an important part of Korean Confucian rationalism of the 18th century. Uh, logos is one of the powers of human minds according to Aristotle, and Aristotle also identified two other powers of mind, ethos and pathos, but the material rich and Chinese counterpart translate logos in particularly in the new Confucian concept of the Li. So he naturally understood that Aristotelian Thomism was compatible with neo Confucianism. So that's how uh, Korean Confucian rationalism was born as a kind of hybrid of the Western philosophy and, and Korean philosophy. So I call E a Confucian rationalist who believed that concept of logos can improve the Confucian epistemology. Humans have logos, the power of pure reasoning. So humans are different from non-humans, animals. So he interpreted this in the Confucian framework that humans are born with the power of moral thinking and moral knowledge. In other words, logos is the evidence that human cognition had multiple levels from a low level thinking and high level thinking. Well, Neo-Confucianists always has this kind of hierarchy in human cognitions, but uh, uh, well, he added another element here, that's rationality. Uh, so, um, well, by doing so, he tried to improve the juices method of the investigation of things and extension of knowledge. I already told you that there was a gap between the investigation of things and extension of moral knowledge. Then he tried to find a bridge between the two by using this Aristotle concept of logos. But when he first knew the concept of logos from Jesuit, he firmly believed that logos is the same faculty of human not thinking as a moral thinking. But to say uh, more specifically, he thought that humans uh, can acquire moral knowledge through uh, multiple steps. First, human can investigate the things. It is the first step Then they can rely on uh, five cents in this first uh, and preliminary step of learning. Then he uh, uh, accepted Aristotle's explanation of human information for this first step. Once we have a sense information which goes to our brain, then uh, brain will um, transfer this scientific knowledge to our heart. So neo confusion in the heart was a cognitive organs. And uh, well, according to E, we make a moral judgment in our heart given by the correct and accurate sense information. So we can see this kind of, uh, uh, well, integration of the two different philosophy in uh, his Confucian rationalism. So he basically imagined that uh, a two stage of thinking, uh, humans minds make a moral judgment before, uh, uh, or, sorry, after having a good scientific uh, knowledge. So there are uh, three steps in, in, in his Confucian rationalism. First, human have the power of hum pure reasoning and morality and moral judgment is the result of the pure reasoning and immorality therefore means irrationality and the lack of scientific knowledge. So humans became immoral because they are not well educated. That's a basic concept of Confucian rationalism. 
Uh, and also this Confucian rationalist uh, believed that madness means immorality and also irrationality. So uh, given the long traditions of neo-Confucianism to believe that the human heart have a cognitive functions, he uh, well basically followed neo-Confucianism. So he was a Confucianist. At the same time, he was a renovator. He renovated it with the European concept. Uh, so here I think uh, I need to summarize. Well, I only didn't spend too much time uh, only about the rationalism. So uh, we need to move on to the empiricism after uh, kind of uh, summarizing. Uh, so Yi, a Korean philosopher, suggested that logos and moral thinking are one body in human cognitions. Uh, so to Yi, uh, mathematics uh, looked very interesting as a proof of logos and human morality. The surprising accuracy of European mathematics not only impressed him, but also changes his worldview of fundamental level. When he learned the Jesuit could calculate the circumference of earth, he praised it and carefully suggested Western civilization might advance more than the Chinese. So there was a, a time of a step out of Sinocentrism. So no longer he believed that Chinese book was the only source of knowledge. Now he looked around and opened his eyes to foreign ideas and foreign uh, knowledge, which is mostly European uh, origins. Uh, well, so European uh, geometry surprised him because you know uh, they can calculate the huge size of Earth without having a visual experience. So that was exact proof of superior high level thinking without experience. So that's a, a, a well thing of the, the, the exact example of the rationalisms. So he encouraged his students to learn geometry and refine their rational thinkings. Uh, but we also need to push it a little bit further for better understanding Confucian rationalism. Uh, there is a, a quite striking weakness in Confucian uh, rationalism. That is, they always believe that human science should be based on uh, ethics. So a science only find its raison d'etre as a method of moral uh, training. So uh, that means a scientist are the most moral person in his uh, concept. Uh, so let me give you one example to prove that Confucian rationalism was uh, still quite far from the method of modern science. Confucian rationalists such as Yi imagined the hierarchy of being uh, along the, the level of morality. So for example, honeybees deserve our attention uh, and worse to be an object of the research because of their superior moral uh, judgments of being loyal to their queen. Uh, but one of the things, uh, in, uh, uh, interesting thing in his study of honeybees, uh, well, is that he never know that, uh, he, he never knew that the, the honeybees actually were loyal to queen, female, not king. So he well believed that uh, the honeybees, the monarch was a king. So uh, he didn't believe that uh, what he saw uh, so there was uh, still uh, great barriers for Confucian rationalists to be a scientist. Uh, also another example of uh, the weakness of Confucian rationalism was the enigma of pi. Uh, I added here, so enigma of irrationality and insanity and unpredictability uh, cannot be an academic topics in this level of Confucian rationalism. They just ignored pi. Well, it cannot exist in this rational regime of mathematics. So they didn't uh, study the nature of irrational uh, part of the nature. Uh, 
Uh, so then let me move to on the second part of my lecture uh, about Korean empiricism. Well, actually, uh, well, many people were more interested in the empiricism in my book. So, uh, well, I'll do my best to summarize uh, this part as much as, as possible. So let's move to the next chapter um, about empiricism. Did Koreans have empiricism in the late Joseon period? Yes, I believe so. Uh, because in world history, we often can find a pair of philosophy. One is rationalism and the other is empiricism. That's quite natural and universal phenomenon. Uh, I hope you don't take philosophy as something high bro uh, because philosophy is a basic part of our life and uh, we don't need to think it seriously uh, uh, well as uh, some just uh, discussions among philosophers. Uh, when it comes to empiricism, so we can uh, actually, actually find it quite easily in our daily life. It means one learns knowledge from experience. It is, means the theory of belief that knowledge comes only or primary from our sensory experience. Well, in this age of internet, empiricists are all around the world. People believe the earth is flat because they see it on, from the YouTube or they learn something from YouTube by watching it. So they never read a book. So that's one of the phenomenon of our age. Uh, so empiricism became another uh, quite dominant idea of the 21st century. Uh, ironically, in the age of uh, uh, the digital uh, technology. So in philosophy, this method of learning is called a posteriori. Uh, it is on the opposite to the a priori. It is a common method of learning in popular society. If someone says that you will learn from a trial and error, This is exact expression of uh, empiricism. So, uh, well, you will figure out when you grow up. That is basic idea of empiricism. So the old man or woman always know the accurate knowledge because they have all these experiences. Well, of course, we can ask the question that the accuracy of their knowledge. Uh, so to be sure, uh, this empiricism has many different uh, varieties within itself uh, and depending on the country and their philosophical traditions. Well, Europeans also have their own empirical learnings and folk knowledge, and Asians have their own empirical learning and empirical uh, set of, of knowledge. Um, well, so we don't need to oversimplify empiricism as just a, a method of trial and error. Um, but as a, as a starter of our discussions, I believe we can regard it as the oldest and the most common method of learning. In human history. So, uh, because we are educator, I hope you also uh, questions to yourself whether you are empiricist or rationalist. Uh, well, empiricism certainly has a strength, but also it has weakness. So we should not, well, use only one method in learning. I think this. Well, at the end of the lecture, I will uh, uh, will uh, explain how Koreans also try to synthesize rationalism and empiricism. That's actually the beginning of scientific uh, empiricisms in Europe. Uh, so for many centuries, the rationalist and empiricist did not trust each other, especially the rationalist uh, was an elite and aristocrats, they disrespected empirical learning as a folk knowledge. Well, the village uh, grandma, I have knowledge about medicine but they are not accurate. So that would be the idea of a rationalist. In East Asian philosophy, uh, empiricism has developed, especially with Taoism in China. And Taoism has a, a different worldview, which we cannot see from Confucianism. Unlike Confucianism, uh, it recognized nature as a single cause and purpose of all happenings. And the way a Tao in Taoism 
exists beyond the best of human knowledge and natural phenomenon has its own cause and effect. So no matter someone has a great ability of the pure rationality, they cannot understand why things change along the time. So seasonal change is, uh, is happening uh, regardless of human's knowledge or human's uh, cognitions. So uh, in this tradition of Taoism, we can see that the knowledge accumulated mostly through experience. So they have all millions of recipes of how to improve one's health or how to fight the cold. So these kind of ideas were mostly collected in this uh, genre called the feng shu. And this is one of the uh, particular uh, form of epistemology in, in Taoism. So Taoism persistently countered the Confucian worldview in, uh, in China, or later in, in Korea as well, and emphasized that human uh, uh, cognition is, is imperfect, seen from the way. So in terms of the theory of knowledge, Taoism contributed to the refinements of empiricism for it asks uh, us to recognize reality as what it is, but it does not have any idea of logic or reasoning. So Taoist empiricism uh, basically just acknowledged uh, the happenings. So for example, bird uh, fly, and then rains drop. So these two are related. That's a basic concept of Taoist or uh, empiricism. So uh, we should not believe that the Taoist empiricism was, uh, uh, was all the same all throughout the se uh, centuries. I, I will tell you how uh, empiricism also uh, evolved into something else uh, with new ideas and renovations. Uh, first of all, in China, uh, Li Shijun, the great uh, uh, physicians, wrote the Bon Chou Gang Mo, and Bon Chou Gang Mo was a, a great example that uh, Chinese uh, scholarships also uh, adopted and, and uh, uh, used empirical knowledge for uh, improving the accuracy of their medical knowledge. So in his book, he used this term uh, hum, experience, as a way of verifying a truth. So uh, I think that's a, one of the examples which you can uh, uh, know as the, uh, the proof that uh, the empiricism was evolving. Uh, in the case of Korea, uh, I wanted to, uh, well, talk about the case of Chong Yak Chun. Uh, well, in the beginning of my lecture, I mentioned his brother, Chong Yak Yong. And in, in general, uh, Korea scholarships uh, will uh, highly evaluate Chong Ya Gyeong's classical learning or classicisms. But in my case, I, I think Chong Ya Gyeong was more interesting because he was empiricist. He collected empirical information to write his book, Encyclopedia of Aquatic Creatures in the Black Island. Uh, his manuscript, well, he, his book was never get published in the time of Joseon dynasty, so uh, we should call it just manuscript. Uh, his manuscript uh, shows uh, a level of a uh, new level of natural studies in Korea. Uh, we can uh, categorize his research in morphology, uh, which classifies animals and plants in each group uh, by examining their forms and appearance. So shark and whales, and other uh, big fish are classified in one group and small fish is classified in another group. So his, his book, his manuscript was basically about the fish and aquatic uh, life and, and the systems by using his observations. So direct observation uh, was uh, one of the accomplishments of his uh, work in uh, Chasanovo, uh, the Encyclopedia of Aquatic Creatures. So I uh, named him as the first example of a Korean's new empiricism 
in the late uh, 18th and early uh, 19th century. Uh, in this book, he dissected the fish to verify his uh, uh, knowledge. Although uh, Zhang Yak Zhou did not have a chance to uh, explain his new method, I think uh, this way of, of learning shows that he have a, a different approach to the theory of knowledge. Uh, well, so we can ask how he uh, renovated empiricisms, although he was a Confucian aristocrat. Well, uh, again, uh, he uh, received the influence from the Jesuit. He joined the first Korean Roman Catholic Church when he was young, and because of that, he got punished and uh, put in exile in a distant island in Yellow Sea, and he died there. And his older brother got executed, and his younger brother, Chung Yak Yong, also uh, stayed in exile for many years. So I think that Chung Yak Yong's exposure to this new Western philosophy uh, made him renovate a uh, traditional way of, uh, of learning and synthesize his sense experience and rationality into another level. Uh, one uh, last thing which I want to talk about, Chung Yak Jung, uh, is related to the Philippines. Uh, Chung Yak Jung was the first Korean man who recorded the Philippines and its language in the 19th century. So Chung Yak Jung and his record about the Philippines, uh, well, certainly need our uh, attentions and, 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 and words to be mentioned. Uh, when he was in exile in the Yellow Sea, he met a Korean fishman who got shipwrecked, and this person got rescued by a ship nearby, and he traveled to Okinawa, and he uh, arrived in the Philippines uh, in his uh, trip back to Korea, and this man picked up some uh, Philippine languages, and Chung Yak John well, wrote down what this per, uh, fisherman uh, learned about the Philippines and its language. So. Uh, well, in that sense, uh, his empirical learning uh, will push him to this new information, and, and he collected it quite carefully as a learned man. So I think that Chung Yak Jung was the first Korean who made a Korean Philippine dictionary uh, in this early 19th century. Uh, well, because I'm almost running out of time, uh, uh, let me just briefly uh, mentions the second figure in my research, that's Yi Gyu Gyeong. Uh, Yi Gyu Gyeong lived a similar time with the Chung Yak Jeon in the early uh, 19th century. And Yi Gyu Gyeong's personal life and academic background still uh, uh, need more research. We don't know uh, quite exactly about his life because he mostly spent his time uh, in retirements and just wrote this magna opus, Oju Yeonmun Changjeon Sanggo, and Ujiyeonmun Jangjeon Sanggo was a collection and classification of knowledge about things. Well, everything, basically. He was very ambitious in his project. Um, well, I, I think I have to skip about this Fang Yizhi in Chinese philosophy uh, and the physics. Uh, so basically, the empiricism in Yi Gyu Gyeong is The value of empirical knowledge of Koreans. So, uh, well, this is a little different from simply nativisms. Koreans know about their own native plants and they know about the Korean dogs and Korean cats. So he basically collected this information from hunters and fishermen and, and farmers and, and respected it as a, some thing equivalent to uh, Chinese knowledge. So Korean knowledge almost for the first time earned the same value with the Chinese knowledge. This is quite interesting uh, progress in the Korean school of philosophy. And uh, well, of course there was uh, some interactions and influence from Chinese philosophy too in, in this formation of Korean empirical learning or nativist. 
As a concluding comment, I, I want to say uh, briefly about the meaning of scientific empiricism as uh, well, a new method and the theory of knowledge of the 19th century in East Asia. Uh, in the Korean history of philosophy, Neo-Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism are three main pillars of thoughts, and you probably know that already. Uh, before the modern age, we have believed that Neo-Confucianism dominated the worldview of Korean elites called the Yangban, and at the same time, some modern Korean scholars glorified uh, uh, this Korean Confucian philosophy as the reason of Korean success and development after uh, independence, or at the same time, some blamed it as the reason of a Korean failure. Well, uh, so there is a well, two parties, two camps, one glorified it and the other uh, blamed it. In my recent book, however, I aim to take a new approach to the Korean philosophy and Korean intellectual history. And what I most highlighted was the global connectivity. So after the Jesuit, introduced Aristotelian Thomism in China, is spread out to Korea, and so this unexpected reactions from Koreans. Uh, today, I had no chance to talk about this early history of Korean Catholics, uh, but uh, as I briefly mentioned, Chung Yak Chan was a member of the first church, uh, Catholic church in, in Korea. So Confucian rationalism and Korean empiricism were both the products of the global intellectual uh, communications and its localization in Korea. Uh, before I end my lecture, uh, let me position Korean uh, rationalism and, and empiricism in the 19th century. Indeed, uh, the new philosophies contribute to the bigger society and the states. The answer is a negative, unfortunately. The Korean dynasty, Chosun dynasty, paid little attention to these new renovations in their theories and educations. Rather, the Chosun dynasty uh, even showed a hostility against any attempts to challenge its dogmatisms. Or we should say neo-confusion. Dogmatisms. So dogmatisms means classical uh, Chinese philosophy, of which the Korean state uh, adopted as a state religions, uh, should be only uh, truth in, in our learning. So why did dogmatisms cause more problem than solution in the 19th century Korea? Most of all, there existed a huge gap between Confucian ideas and Korean reality. States only understood the reality through the lens of Confucian ideas. So humans should be moral, they must be loyal to their king, but the reality was quite different. So Koreans experience was not exactly the same uh, as what has uh, written in classical Chinese book. So when Aristotle, uh, uh, sorry, Ar aristocrats uh, understood the reality through the lens of Chinese classics, the Korean peasants and popular society uh, had a different idea. They spoke in vernacular Koreans and they read the fictions in vernacular language. So there is a growing gap between the realities and, and, the, uh, and the ideas and this gap actually caused so many problems in Korea, but the state had no solutions or they, it has no intention to find the solutions. So 19th century Korea, so many popular rising and increasing threats from the foreign countries, mostly Western countries, but the regime came up with no uh, way to solve or improve uh, the problems in their uh, Confucian dogmatisms. So Korean intellectual history, uh, well, as I explained today's lecture has so much dynamic evolutions in the 18th and 19th century. And I believe that intellectual history did not end with the Confucian rationalism and empiricism. There must be new developments in the 19th century and also in the early 20th century, Koreans adopted com communism. You know, then also they adopted liberal capitalism and democracy. So Koreans were very, very active 
in, in terms of this uh, reception of foreign ideas, and they always branded in, in the Korean way. So uh, I probably uh, do more work for explaining this uh, localization in my second book. Um, but, uh, well, currently I will just propose to write more about 19th century. So uh, maybe when I became 60s, I can write about 20th century. So it will take time. So I hope you be patient uh, until I give you another lecture about 20th century Korean uh, philosophy. Uh, I'm sorry for spending more time uh, in my lecture and thank you for listening.